I was born in 1973, which was only eight years after the official end of Jim Crow. Considering my age, you can see that legalized racial discrimination didn't end all that long ago. Yet rarely do we include this fact or any of the ghosts of Jim Crow when we talk about the history of racism. To be clear, black people in America only just got free 51 years ago. Imagine how different our conversations on race might be if we could acknowledge that painful reality and what it has meant for black Americans, rather than try to disregard or dismiss it. Somehow the subject of racism in our country has become the third rail. The third rail is that extra track on the subway with the electric current, the rail that means certain death if you were to touch it. In 2016, racism is considered the third rail because it's a topic too risky to touch. But racism should not be the third rail. Talking about it is not going to kill us. It may lead to discomfort and awkwardness, but both are better than passively allowing racism to entrench itself and spread like a disease. It's not talking about it that's far more dangerous. There are a number of reasons why we downplay just how insidious and deadly racism is and ignore the importance of keeping the topic active and in the open. In some instances, it's because we confuse personal prejudice with racism. To be human does at times require judging other people. But racism isn't just bias or prejudice, nor is it sometimes even the same as bigotry. It's just as widespread as all three, but it's far more potent. Racism is a system. It's a system that undergirds everything that we do. This system requires power and privilege for some, and marginalization and disadvantage for others. And in creating America, power and privilege were bestowed upon people with skin we call white, while slavery was enforced upon people with skin we call black. Racism was thus woven into the fabric of the United States. Our Constitution is an amazing document that hints at new promise, but that promise was only available to white people. The founders of this country and the framers of the Constitution were creating a new reality while enslaving people. People who had been abducted and brought to a strange new land and were forced to work and build a country that was not their own. Yes. Stolen people on stolen land. As a nation, we've never truly grappled with what it means to stand on a foundation that was built with the blood and bodies of stolen and enslaved people. Instead, we've spent too much trying, time trying to create an alternate reality based on half-truths. We tell ourselves that the sins of the dead no longer affect us. We say that slavery was long ago. We tell black people, get over it. We tell white people that what the white people of yesterday did has no impact on them, when nothing could be further from the truth. Our history has devolved into an inequitable system where you benefit if you're white, and if you're black, the scars of the past still impact your life. If you're neither black nor white, you live with a framework of race in America that privileges those with proximity to white skin and demonizes those closer to black skin. To talk honestly about race requires a public acknowledgement that what happened to black people in America was a national horror. It was a human stain. It was a holocaust of sorts as people were taken away from everything that they knew and brought to a new place. Now, 400 plus years later, there are over 37 million non-Hispanic black people in a place that is home, but is not home. Yet, we can't ever go back because there's no back to go to. We can never fully belong in a place where we were originally never meant to be fully human and often still aren't treated as fully human. Black people in America were never meant to survive and thrive. We were the critters brought to do the dirty work of building a nation, but we weren't meant to be a part of the larger story. Even after slavery ended, America didn't issue a blanket apology to the enslaved Africans, nor make amends for hundreds of years of mistreatment. No, we merely moved from slavery to reconstruction to Jim Crow. If you remember the Beatles, Jim Crow probably lasted into your lifetime. My father was born in Blyville, Arkansas. His parents, my grandparents, were sharecroppers under Jim Crow. Sharecropping sounds like a nice collaborative effort, but for black people, it was one degree of separation from slavery. You worked the land of someone else, you were technically free, but you were nickel and dime to the point that if you couldn't 
pay your way out of the system, you are essentially enslaved. Members of my family, including my own father, picked cotton under one of these post-slavery plantations. With such a history, it's not surprising that racism is difficult to talk about, difficult to change, and difficult to fully grasp. But difficult doesn't mean that it's not worth our time. <laughs> to put this into perspective, I have a background in African American studies. I grew up in Chicago. I do racial justice work, and I'm several generations removed from slavery. But even I've had my own moments of racial awakening. My most poignant awakening came when I brought a white partner home to a family reunion, and my uncle could barely contain his anger at the presence of a white man in his home. I didn't understand. But I would later learn about the indignities that my father, my uncle, and my paternal family suffered under Jim Crow at the hands of white people. I would also find out that what my father's family suffered and endured was more than drinking at a different water fountain. Jim Crow was a system of oppression designed to keep black people from fully being free and creating a universal experience of dehumanization for many black Americans. Nonetheless, our history books often advance a reductive view of Jim Crow by conflating it with the civil rights movement and distilling it down to water fountains in separate schools. Even I'm still learning how insidious racism is. So I'm asking everyone to be open to hearing and learning the same truths, not halfway, but all the way. We cannot accomplish anything if we're not willing to hear everything. It's horrible for me to hear those stories from my family, and I'm guessing it might be uncomfortable or even shameful for you to hear this if you're sitting in the audience in a white body. So does that mean we're just not going to talk about it? These are the hard conversations to have, but the process of change requires a willingness to leave our respective silos and actually do better. Doing better on a racial front requires examining yourself, how you live, and the decisions that you make. If your entire world is filled with people just like you, what does that mean for your commitment to racial justice? Will you call out racism, even if it means losing a loved one? Will you intentionally become uncomfortable so that racial equity can be achieved? Will you decrease so that another can increase? Can you hear this without becoming defensive? And choosing not to tell the honest and painful story of slavery, sharecropping, and opportunistic oppression, we continue to devalue and deny the lived experiences of black people in America. We continue to avoid facing a shared inheritance of pain and deceit that creates an artificial hierarchy where too often black people are seen as inferior. We can't build a different future on a present that still won't fully acknowledge what was done to tens of millions of people in our shared past. In the last five years, racism has entered more into public discourse, due in large part to media coverage and conversations around the highly publicized stories of unarmed black people being killed by law enforcement. However, when we combine the frequency of such discussions with our reluctance to truly tackle the layers of racism in this country, what we end up with is a lack of depth and nuance overall. We've made discussions of race intellectual and abstract rather than human and raw. They become bland and ultimately useless. This commentary is a start, but if we only partially confront racism with Facebook conversations, the danger is that we think ourselves fully informed without acknowledging the ways in which racial prejudice and oppression have been woven into the American fabric. Law enforcement taking a black life is not an isolated incident. It is a symptom of a complex problem and mindset that has been with us since the creation of our nation. And yet, we are here. And somehow, in one of the greatest feats of human resilience in the face of the unspeakable, black lives matter.
not only are we here, but we now declare not only that black lives matter, but after straddling the line of partial humanity for far too long, we stake our claim and right to full humanity. The simple declaration, though, that black lives matter, however, still creates great angst amongst too many white people. And the pushback to the Black Lives Matter movement is a reminder of just how many refuse to acknowledge racism's impact. To truly talk about racism actually requires acknowledging the blood of dead enslaved Africans and realizing that even at this moment in time, blood is still being shed. It's difficult to talk about racism honestly because we often use a rhetoric that's theoretical and politically correct. Other times, when we speak truth to power, it can be seen as indulgent whining. Let me speak my truth for a moment, not as an ambassador or a leader or a TEDx speaker, but as a human being. One of the most uncomfortable realities of racism for me is the ways in which it undermines my humanity. I walk through life never quite feeling whole, forced to see myself through a blurred lens of who I really am as a person and who I represent based off the color of my skin. It is at times to suppress parts of my own humanity in order to fit in, despite knowing on some level I may never truly fit in because there are some people who still refuse to see me as a whole human being equal to them, even despite their good intentions. As a black person, I am always seen as other, other than white, other than what is considered normal. Instead of prattling off the data because I don't want to be an angry black woman stereotype, I could play a tentative dance where I ignore the ways in which my full humanity is ignored and my reward could be incomplete inclusion into the party of humanity. For some, a partial seat at the table of humanity is enough. But I'm no longer interested in a partial anything if it means denying my blackness and my realities. In fact, I'm not asking us all to meet in the middle. I'm not asking you to fully understand some things and only partly acknowledge others because you have less proximity to them. You don't have to have first-hand experience with racism to understand it. I'm asking you to hear me. I am demanding it. Sometimes meeting in the middle helps, and other times it only placates. It offers a halfway solution that doesn't serve either side. I'm not asking for this. I'm standing here right now in a room filled with mostly white people sharing some of the most uncomfortable things I've ever shared in my life with a group of people, and I'm asking everyone to not be satisfied with your good intentions or with meeting in the middle, to not be okay with granting a group of people a halfway humanity. Maine still has a lot of work to do in creating mirrors, though, that reflect positively for women of color. Making my life here has meant finding a voice to affirm my own existence. It has meant learning to be my own savior and hope, where some days the act of leaving my house requires a level of strength that simply should not be required to go to the store. Some days, I don't want to indulge questions about my hair or comments about my children. And frankly, I don't always want to talk about race. Sometimes I just want to be a woman living my life. No more, no less. But the color of my skin in Maine makes me the walking ambassador for all things black. I don't always want to talk about race, but it's not so easy to choose not to. If it's easy for you to choose not to talk about race, think harder about what you're enabling and avoiding when you do that. Examine why it's easy for you not to talk about race. I've been given a weight that I didn't ask for, but I also have a voice, and I'm going to use it to create conversations with the idea that one day a black woman can live anywhere and simply be a woman. Thank you.